What's going on, y'all? You know the time, live at nine. We still celebrating Black History Month up in here. Every day, every day is Black History Month. To me, at least. Um, we got a special guest in the building. Um, Vietnam vet, uh, Vietnam vet, cancer survivor, soldier. Yeah, soldier. Um, everything. Uh, so he survived it all, seen it all, and here to tell it all. That's right. Mr. Bobby Hood, thank you for coming. It's, it's, it's a pleasure. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no problem, no problem. So, just first off, like, so you grew up in Birmingham, Alabama. Yes, I did. How how was that? Like, how was that going? Well, you know, during the kids, you know, we was limited to certain places where we could go and, and things we couldn't do. You know, if you know the mic a little closer. When we uh, well, especially if we had to go down in down in this town town area. Mm-hmm. If we're gonna go like to uh, shop or have food, you know. We had to sit at a certain end of the counter where color, they used the word color and white, color and white, you know, and same thing with the fountain, same thing with color, color fountain, white fountain. So we was limited to those things, you know, growing up in that time. So what would you say, um, like to get people up to speed, like what kind of, what time frame was this when you grew up in? Yeah. Oh, it was uh, in the fifties, in the late fifties, going late into 50s. the sixties, right. Okay, okay, so yeah. that was around, I guess, that was before Martin Luther King got killed, oh, before more, Malcolm X got much, killed. Exactly. So you was able to, so you was born around the time where the movement was just exactly was just it was being, had its being, peak being for, created, to coming about, and everything. Okay, okay. Did um, did you ever get to see any of the major civil rights leaders? I know well, been, you know, they came through some some of the places that I, that I attend, some churches, but they were more like of, 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 uh, in front of before me. I was like behind them, like we you know with the crowd. So uh, I didn't see as much of them, but. They, I was in the midst, you know, to that effect. Okay, okay, that's dope. Um, so, just um, what would you say? How was it growing up as a black man? And I, and, and I, love, I know you mentioned that they had like segregation, but just just focus just in on you. Like, how was it growing up as a black man in the South? Like I said, we was limited. You know, we tried to get along with everyone that that we tried to, but we mostly like stayed to ourselves. Was you it know. was there getting along with white people in the south? No, it wasn't. You know, like cordial. They, you, or? It, you, you, you was limited. You could work in the environment, but you limited to be around them. You know, you had a certain space you could be in in their presence. You know, unless you was in their home. But you outside the outside that perimeter, you know, you just you just it's off just you know it's off limits. You know, it's off limits. Like because of segregation, or it, it just, off, off limit because of segregation okay. at that time. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. So how did that did that make you feel a type of way or, or back well, then? Well, at the time being young and I couldn't identify, you know, the difference between integrations, you know, segregating integration, you know. So I just went along, as I just said, just following the lead, you know. So whatever everybody was doing, I was doing, you know. Did you, know, you ever doing, like wonder why you couldn't? Hang out with over there, well, or was it just? It never appeared to me because I was most like just associated with my 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 surrounding. So we didn't wasn't trying to get into too much. Okay. We just just growing up, just being a kid and just enjoying our life. But until other things start happening, we start finding ourselves getting more and more involved. You know, understanding what we was not uh, entitled to do and what things could cause to get ourselves in a lot of trouble. You know. What would what would you say would be like a lot of trouble? Come like well, if you feel like you're trying to get, go go against the, the policy, sit where they told you not to sit, then that's 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 bringing on the problem right there because they figure like you you see the sign say white and you're gonna be in that in that in that, in that zone that you know you're asking for trouble you know to that effect. So it was pretty much illegal, exactly, to, like, right. like to even sit in a white area. Exactly. So in other words, we know our boundary. So most of we didn't go out, go outside that circle. We stayed inside the circle where we didn't want to get make make trouble. But there was those that did uh, pursue it. You know, some just went on and said, well, "I'm going to do it anyway, and regardless of what." Some did. And I some feel like did. I would have been one of those people back <laughs> then. I don't know if I'd have made it. I would be being honest. Like I'd have been like, "I'm sitting wherever I feel like sitting." <laughs> I know. Shout out to Rosa Parks too. She just they just celebrated her birthday. Like you know, like I always admire people like um, in that that field. Like um, not to be talking too much. I know that, you know, but just more so like with Rosa Parks, like. I always bring her up when I'm bringing up, like when you got to stand up for something, because mm-hmm. I look at Rosa Parks, she was an elderly woman at that yes. time. And 
I know it was plenty of days that she got up for the white man. You quite know what sure, I'm saying? Quite sure. That but day she time, said, she was tired. I'm not. She had worked in, 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 in yeah. the house all day. She was not going to be going to the back when the seat was right there in the front. That's what I'm saying. I'm right. like, I know it's other days she probably did do it, but exactly. she decided but that time. day it's not happening. Not today. Not today. You know what I'm right. Saying? Regardless of what happened, not today. That's what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. If anybody out there needs to Rosa Parks stay life. Doesn't matter what day it is. You say today is not the day. There you go. And moving forward, moving forward, you just keep moving. Exactly. Stand up for your rise. <laughs> so um, now nowadays, you know, we're in the twenty, you know, twenty twenties, I guess, stuff like that. When you hear people say, "Oh, uh, racism doesn't exist anymore." Or, it's dead now. What what is when you say what again? I hear when people when people people some people like to say oh racism is dead or it doesn't exist anymore. What's oh, your, no, what's, no 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 it's it's much very much alive. We we can look at things that been happening out in Staten Island and these in the, here right in New York City. Was well, like it's being in, being done indirectly, but see in the South. They let you know. The white man let you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, how far you could go. Funny. You know, even though it's 2020, 2019, they still let you, they let you know, I don't like you. Regardless of who you are, how much education you have, you know your boundary. If you don't, if you try to step over your boundary, respect the consequences, you know. Mm. At least they, that's in Birmingham. I mean, maybe some other states too, but at least I do this for my hometown. They let you know. We don't just smile your face. If we don't smile your face because we don't like it, we just don't like it. We're not going to be phony and fake. They're going to just tell you to, we just don't like it. There are some do and some don't, you know, simple mm. as that. Wow. Did you um, ever have, like, I mean, I'm pretty sure you had a lot of fearful experiences from just being black, but um, was that, like, around, like, the town? Like, is it was it, like, a lot of, like, things going on? Like, we're going to get into, like, a lot of events that happened around that time, but just as an early kid, did you see anything that was just, like, what was your first moment when you well, realized? Well, in the beginning, before everything started taking, uh, happening, it, we, there was, they was, uh, they were trying, the people was trying to get from segregation because they wanted to get into work, to work in the environment with, with, with the whites and stores and, and want, want, some wanted to uh, join the fire department, police department. And I used to see a lot of activity where uh, people went black, went forward to try to do it but they was always shut down the door was closed and they was not taking no application they weren't um, gonna accept anything uh, where they didn't want us to be at so whatever we wanted to do they said no you're not entitled to it so that's what brought a lot of things on they figured why shouldn't we be you know this is our home we live here why we can't work in the, in the uh, stores why we can't do these things so a lot of questions and this led to a lot of other things that they protested against it they figured they should be entitled to do it. So one thing led to another. They started demonstrating. They started protesting. Police started bringing dogs in on it. You know, uh, when he was down, you know, in the city, you know, in the downtown area. And they was, you know, using as attack dogs on them for their own advantage against us, you know. So Did you see that with your own eyes? Well, I, I wasn't there at the time. when I just see it on TV. Okay. But other things later on, uh, I did see, you know. Okay, okay. We're going to get into that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to. Uh, so you were, you were, you, well, you were alive around with the 16th Street uh, church bombing. Yes. Uh, I don't, I don't know much about that. So can you just describe to a lot of people who might not know about that either? Well, you know, the church itself is where a lot of civil rights leaders uh, went for their conference. You know, they sit down, and they uh, work things out, talk things out, and I believe that a lot of whites at the time, they say clans. Uh, seeing that it'd be, that was like a big thing. They didn't like to see us doing things that, that they seen we getting too much attention. And this led to um, the bombing of the church, but didn't come right then and there. But to, to, add, to address that, um, I had a friend of my, my, my at the school out 10, my teacher had a daughter that came to visit her on a Friday around in September 63. And uh, as she was leaving the building, um, she happened to happen to see me going through the hallway, and she happened to ask me, "Do I attend church?" You know, and I told her yes. So she was telling me they was having a program at her church, and she would like to know would I like to come. So I asked her what church it was. She told me it was the 16th Street Baptist Church, and I told her I would. So this was like on a Friday. So that Sunday when I was gonna uh, go, I was contemplating. Should I go to her church first in the morning for Sunday school and for the program, 
or should I go to my church from Sunday school and lead to her church? So it was a lot of contemplation, but even though if I had a went uh, uh, at the time, we didn't have like IDs, you know, like if anything happened, no one could be able to ID who you was. Mm -hmm. So I decided I'm gonna go to my church first and then I will lead to go to her. So as I'm going to my church, when you hear something very, very quiet and something from an echo come from a distance, it catch you thing like, like a boom, like an echo, like mm -hmm. what was that, you know? So I didn't know what it was, that the sound, what it was until I got to my church. So after I arrived, my pastor came downstairs from the studies and told the congregation that the 16th Street Church had just been bombed. But I was still confused because I was trying to think, I said, he couldn't mean that, could he? it must mean the Sixth Avenue Baptist Church. So later on when I got home that evening, that morning, that afternoon rather, he had it on the TV, that it had got bombed. So when I arrived to school the next day, the teacher was in the hallway, they was all crying and things, and I couldn't understand why. And they come to tell us that my teacher and her daughter, Cynthia Wesley, was there in the basement with the other three girls that got killed. And it, my mind was frozen because I never at that time spoke on that issue to, not, to my principal or either any of the other teachers. So even though I went to the funeral, you know, and everything, so when the mother, the teacher came back to school, I happened just mentioned to her, your daughter was here the day she came to visit you and she invited me to come and I was, I was gonna come, but I wanted to go to my church first, and then I'll come to your church, you know, later on. She said, Bobby, if you had a came, and knowing me, I would probably would have made myself known to her, I am here, and that would have been right down in the basement where I've been trying to find where she was. And she said, your mother would have been missing a son. Instead of being a full girl, it had been four girls and a boy, you know. Mm -hmm. So I was blessed and grateful that I did not make that move because like I said if I had her they would have not known who I was because there was no ID on my on my behalf you know wow. so after all this occurred we start protesting again across the street from the 16th Street Baptist Church is Kelly Ingram Park so we had heard there's going to be a demo, uh, demonstration there so a friend of mine named Abraham we left our home in our community and went downtown across to, to uh, Kellerina Park, and uh, we joined the crowd. To our surprise, we didn't know what to expect. So outside the park was firemen and the police with the dog, and the mayor, which they call him Bull Connolly, he had a white tank outside, and they was trying to uh, disturb, disturb the, uh, get us to break it up the protest, mm -hmm. the demonstration, more to speak. So. What they figured like they're not gonna leave, so they told he told the fireman shoot the hose in on them and through the park, you know, mm -hmm. all us there. And to be uh, in, in in a situation like the, to have water from a hose pressure, you you all just flying all around the place mm -hmm. like you know like little puppy dogs and everything. And it was was something I would I didn't know was gonna happen this way. So after a while, they decided we'd do something different, send the dogs into the park. So I think they sent about, maybe about six or eight dogs in the park and we, while we was in there. They never came back out the park. That pissed them off. Oh. The firemen, the policemen, and the mayor. So they returned again with the, with the, with the water hose. Mm -hmm. So this went on for about a couple of hours or better. They stopped, you know. So the strange, the scary part about it all, when you leave from out the park, you got to go outside the perimeter where people can see you wet. If the police see you wet, they know where you just came from. So now right. you got to try to run behind buildings and oh, other places and get home and hope you don't be seen or be kept. Because if they see you, this is brought up in daytime, this is up in the afternoon, 12, 1 o'clock. If they have to see you wet, soaking wet with water, they know where you just came from. And you don't know what they could have, they, what they would do. They'd probably arrest you. You probably wouldn't, wouldn't make it to jail. They'd probably take you somewhere and hang you. At that time, it could be done and one will never even know you was uh, captured by the police. So I, my friend, was very lucky and blessed that we was able to get from downtown Birmingham to get back in our community safe. So that was an experience itself as a whole, you know. Wow, so you were still uh, like around that time where 
cops would just take you and they could hang you. Oh, shoot. I mean, uh, most of the next day, what they call them rednecks, you know. So anytime a cop come against a black man, seeing you as by, by yourself, they can uh, call, find anything to try to use against you to arrest you. Don't mean you're going to go to court for it. You know, you could be court, day court, you know, mm -hmm. take you somewhere and, and trial you for whatever they want to call it. And parents never see you again. They see you, they see you somewhere hanging from a tree somewhere, you oh know. And then be nobody going to investigate the cause. At that time, nobody going to investigate cops because they figure, I, you know, you deserve it. So, boom, you're just a dead child and just buried in the grave and that's, and that's it, you know. Wow. And just speaking from a, a perspective of just knowing a lot of people that deal with anxiety and stuff like that, um, do you feel like people that lived in that area and witnessed that, do you feel like any of them would suffer from anxiety oh, now oh, today? Exactly. I mean, still today, you know, because uh, people today, not, they don't put up with much as today. They've been, been like them. People, their voices more vo going forward. Mm -hmm. And they do speak their voice. They do speak their mind. They see what they have to say. So they're not limited now. They figure, okay, I have a voice and I have the right to speak my voice. So where we used to be quiet, they used to be quiet in my home, their voice is being heard. You know, they're going forward, letting you know I'm a person, I'm a man, I'm a woman, and I'm entitled to speak my voice about anything I feel is not right. I'm going to let you know how I feel. Whatever, uh, whatever uh, circumstances, consequences is, uh, I had to face, I'm, I'm willing to do it, you know. So did you have to like do uh, what, what have you, how do you like deal with stuff like that, like stuff in your past? Have you just gotten over it? Had you, did you have to go see somebody? Well, or? I happen not, doesn't come in contact, I haven't come in contact with a lot of things that I hear about a lot of people say they come in contact with because I don't know right now how I will act because some people say if it was me, you never know because life not going to present to you what it presents to me. So it may be different, a whole different uh, scenario by how somebody may come to me. And just off the top of my head, I may feel where I know what I've been through back in the past. I don't think I'm going to be too quiet too much. I may speak my mind a little bit more than they may be expected. I may not be think, thinking about consequences, but I'm going to speak my mind. I figure if I got a voice to say, as you will say, I'm going to tell you how I feel. If I don't feel that I'm, if I feel I'm, I'm being mistreated, you know. Yeah. Yeah, because I know a lot of people deal with it today and they exactly. don't speak up. So I can only imagine people back then exactly. dealing with all that kind of stuff. You know, we talk about anxiety a lot on this mm -hmm. show. I was going to ask, too, because, like, do you, because um, you survived a lot, like, just a lot, like, we're going to get into more of it, too, later. But just from what you just told us, you survived a lot. Like, how do you feel, like, how now a lot of people are, um, I guess, committing suicide? That's why a lot of mental health is being talked about so much because they're trying to save lives through it. But you've been through so much like what do you think kept you going like is there something that like is there ever a time you ever felt like giving up because it's not like i don't even know like i told you i don't even know if i'd have made it through that time like, <laughs> i just i guess you would say me myself i never looked at things too much like um how i guess when i once i got over what had happened you know i just moved on and um i just dealt with it one day at a time if anything came my way, I guess I was deal with it the best I knew how. But many things that had happened got around past me that I didn't happen to me. I didn't have to come in contact with nothing that made me have to stand up and had to express myself. So after all was said and done, I went on that joined the military and uh, moved on from one thing to another. Oh, by the way, this here shirt here I'm wearing, mm -hmm. this is from uh, from Birmingham, from Kelleringa Park when they was uh, showing the holes being shot on us and everything. Mm -hmm. this, is the, this was being shown in 1963, I mean, 1960, 19, 2013. Mm -hmm. They uh, brought these about, and uh, I, uh, Ms. Berry and I was there, and they was advertised this at 2013. Mm -hmm. They were celebrating the uh, anniversary of, uh, of the uh, civil rights year. You know, they had this here, they were showing they had, you know, letting them know we, 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 we missed the anniversary in 2013 because we was in Birmingham, but we were on our way back to New York. So we missed the 50th anniversary of what had took place at the time, you know. Okay. So we missed that, but we, we knew about it, but we just wasn't, we was able, we wasn't they able to stay alone to be a part of it, you know, the anniversary of the two. I think it was, I think it was 50 years, I believe it was. 50 years. 50 years, Birmingham. yeah. Mm -hmm. So how is Birmingham now? Are they more, is it better? Oh, is I would consider say yes, it is. 
consider from looking back up the 50 years mm -hmm. and today much better. You know, I feel that we don't hear Steve's your first black mayor of Birmingham. Yes, yeah, Mayor William Bell, you know, and I, there was others came behind him, you know. Uh -huh. So uh, we have came a long way for him. And, you know, in the back, you should get a picture of President Obama with him and all, you oh. know. So uh, we have came a long, we have come a long ways, you know. So uh -huh. things have changed, you know, and uh, people still doing what they have to do. And they're not afraid to say what they have to say, you know, and that's a blessing. Yeah. Um, you wanted to ask about the Vietnam. You want to ask about that? Yeah, so... Um, so after you had to deal with the civil rights, you went to, did you go to the war to like escape it or did they draft you? Like how did that Well, work? at the time being young and not knowing what the war was, I volunteered. Oh, okay. <laughs> did, they, did they promise you anything or did no. you just? Well, the only thing they said, if you happen to come back, uh, you could you be able to uh, choose your hometown uh, fort, you know, close to you live, where you live at. So if you put that down, you write it down, whatever uh, fort was close to your hometown, you could go when you come back from via if you survive you'd be so i have to put down the fort mcclellan where i which is about 65 miles outside of birmingham you know so i did get that and uh i think i had at least about maybe about eight nine months left after i got back from vietnam so i was able to have that worked out for me you know that's good so yeah. um you weren't scared to lose your life over there well you know what that was an experience called being young Never know what a war is all about until after I arrived. Everything was like, okay, I can do this for one year, you thought, until something happened. So in 60, um, 68, in January, the thing they called the Tet Offense. And that's when I realized I was in a war because we started getting hit with rockets and mortars and a lot of those things that I have never experienced in my life. And you was in Vietnam. That was in Vietnam. Yeah. So if you've never been been around bombs and things like this here, it's all new to you. It's scary as hell. I can imagine. You know, so you you pray, you pray to God that you make it back home the way you could care. But there was a lot that did not. And um, I, I, I'm sympathetic about that because I've been a lot of brothers that uh, lost their life. I met them and then I didn't, didn't see them no more, you know. And I was told by others that what had happened to them. So that was an experience itself. But I was thankful the way I am in one piece, yes. Yeah, but yeah. mentally, it wasn't the same. I can remember. Because being around bums for almost uh, uh, eight or nine months, and you come back to the States, and you hear something uh, like a, uh, any kind of something, Sound noise. Like fireworks? You know, it, firecracker, anything real, real loud. Before you know it, you think you're back, you know it, before you know it, you're up under this table. And people looking at you like, What's, what's all that? What's that all about? You still uh, shell shock. Yeah, shell shock. You still shell shock. But they, if it takes someone to understand, this was a, a, a war soldier that went through something, and he stills going through. Even after ten years, it was still affecting me. Twenty years, it was still affecting. And I didn't know. Still dreams. I just still know was still in my mind. It just don't go away like that. It don't go away easily. Do you feel like a, like the government has done enough to help veterans they are with doing that? It, they are doing it now. At the first, they, they wasn't doing it. But we have those uh, uh, counselors out there making sure that we get what we're entitled to. We're in a disability, that we uh, got ourselves in, use losing limb, mentally, situation, hearing, uh, eye, whatever they feel that is conversation, conversated, Compensated to us, to a veteran, male or female, we I feel we are getting it now. We are getting it now. I for one mm -hmm. am I getting yeah, money. because I feel like I, I see a lot of when I'm on the train. I see a lot of vets, yeah. you know, ask for money and stuff like that. And I just feel well, bad. Cause I don't feel like, when I see it. I feel they don't have to be there. It don't have to be there because they do have help. When I see a, a person on the street with a sign saying I'm a veteran, it, it makes me upset because I feel yeah. either you joking or lying, just trying to get money. Ask, like, you, know, you, that, yeah. you know, because when I see that, I said, you don't have to be there because we have help. We got those for those need for housing and uh, other things that they need, that veterans are entitled to. They got, they got the kind of facilities out there for us. So we don't have to be out on the street with no sign saying, uh, give me this because uh, I need the money to do this money to do that. They have stuff we entitled to. Hmm. So, do you feel like your experience in Vietnam and stuff like that, even though 
it leaves you with a lot of anxiety and stuff like that today. Well, I don't say a lot, but just like a little bit. Um, do you feel like there was some good things you got out of it? Like maybe you were more mature after you left or you just like more disciplined? Well, you know what? What for all this other happening, the things was happening with the bum and stuff, we didn't want to think about we was in a war. We just tried to get along. That's the first time. That's something to think about. That's just, that was the very first time that you seen us like this. Really? It wasn't you from New York, you from Georgia, you from California. No one asked that question. Even though they asked, it didn't mean nothing. We was, you want to see black and you see come together, you seen it in Vietnam. If you seen a brother get in an argument with another, we come to, hey, we don't do that. We spoke to love. That's where you see the love. We was, it was just, it naturally just came on us. We didn't, we had to, uh, uh, how you say, we didn't have to rehearse it. Mm -hmm. It just naturally came out of our, out of our, within us. The love that we have for, for each other. That's the first time we've seen us as a as a black race mm -hmm. over there. We stuck together. That's that's we good. stuck together. It wasn't about it because you from one state and I'm from another. We separate from each other. It didn't mean nothing. We just had a good bond and we did the best we could to get along with each other. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, congratulations for surviving all that. Yeah, I don't you. know. I, I don't think, know if that like well, means anything. Mean, but like congratulations. It means a lot. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. A lot. Thank you. <laughs> that's a lot you went through. Yeah. Like, you yeah, know. Yeah, thank you. And to still you. be here to tell your story, that is yes, definitely a blessing. You. So thank you very much. Did you want to ask about um the whole cancer? Why well, you, you haven't gotten to talk much? So. <laughs> I was talking. I mean, you can talk right now. It's on this <laughs> part. So um, the last, the last uh, bit of your testimony. Um, you also a prostate cancer survivor. Yes. Um, when you were first diagnosed with that, like, um, how did that make you feel? Well, you know what? At the time, I didn't know it was it was this. I do you know they had to say you had to. Uh, at a certain age, you had to, you know, the doctor, when you go to the doctor for exam, they feel at a certain age, they had to take a test. And I was, I had to went to Building 55 in, in Harlem, and I stayed, took the test. And um, they sent it downtown to uh, 23rd Street, and I got a phone call from the physician there telling me they want me to come downtown, they wanted to speak to me. And when I arrived, I was told that on the scale from maybe say one to five, I was like two and a half with, with prostate. I did, I did not know what prostate cancer was. Cause in my circle, of, of, uh, that was not discussed. Cause I didn't know what, even the word cancer, uh, I didn't know what the word, when they know the word used the word tumor. Oh, okay. I didn't hear the, I didn't hear, what's a tumor, you know? Cause wasn't nobody in my circle talking tumor, uh, but later on I heard somebody talk about the cancer. So they told me what it was. They said I was like two and a half and I needed to have it be removed. And I need to go home and talk to my family, which I did to my wife and my children. And I had to give them, I told them what I had to go through. So I went through the process and I had uh, my prostate removed. And How old were you when you found out? Oh, I'm quite sure I must be in about 56 or 57, okay. you know. And that was, that was something I never knew that I was held but it did a lot to my body. She changed my body completely, you know. Things that were well, how it used to be, it wasn't, it's not the same, you know. Okay. So it did a lot. But I thank God that it's out, and it's like it's 15 years now. Oh, yeah, congratulations. For, yeah, for 15 that years too. cancer free now. Yeah, you survived. Yeah, man. I thank God for that. <laughs> they got like a movie about Mr. Bobby Hood coming yeah, soon. You should have a movie. <laughs> <laughs> that's a fact. Nah, that's, that's, um, that's definitely like. Um, uh, How long did the whole process take for you to recover from that? From for the prostate? Yeah. Well, right now, um, like I said, it's been 15 years. Um, it took about a, a about a year and a half okay. for my body to uh, get back on track. But there's certain things you had to do that the doctor recommended what you had to do as you're going through it within yourself to get things back on track. Some have some things would not get back like you used to. So you had to do whatever medication they give you to do what you had to do at, the, at that time, you know. And that's one of the most common cancers for men, right? I believe. Yeah, prostate. Yes. Would you would you, would you advise like men as I they get older to, to get checked? I feel any man at a certain age when he should, whenever you have your your position to tell you to come at a certain age to go be checked, don't hesitate. You hate to be at the last minute saying I don't want to go because I'm gonna find out I may have this. Go anyway. 
If he could save you to stay here to be able to talk about it today, go anyway. And to be the last minute, I have a friend of mine uh, about two, three years ago, I believe, that he had it, and we didn't know he had it, but he didn't want to tell anyone about it. When we found out, he was in stage four. Mm. And we only see each other like once a year in the summertime, and we always enjoy seeing each other. And when I heard that he had it, he was in stage four, next thing we know, he only had about two or three weeks to live. Oh, and wow. was, especially with someone who's a very good close friend to you and you enjoy each other's company during the summer and all of a sudden you hear about this it, it's heartbreaking you know yeah. so I recommend any man uh, if you got a doctor stay in touch with your doctor and let him tell you what you need to do and take, make sure you're taking care of yourself properly you know as a fact those stuff don't wait don't start no don't wait to start don't right. start making changes today right do it now no. do it do it Absolutely. now i just want to ask when did you have any signs any symptoms oh yeah at the time i had the, the, the uh was in my in my system where when you had to go the bathroom sometimes your urine doesn't come out fast enough it come out slowly that's to let you know your prostate has fallen up mm -hmm. that's what happened mine has fallen up like a golf ball Oh, wow. And you're trying to urinate and everything, and you you know it's not coming out properly, you know. Until that uh, uh, tumor have been removed, then everything can flow much better. But you have to go and find out why it's not uh, coming like it's supposed to, so the doctor can tell you what what it is. Wow. Now, what's what would advice would you give people, or just like what what do you use to help like this push you? Because you've been through so much. What 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 has helped you? What do you you know, tell yourself to help well, you push uh, through. Being a spiritual person as I am, you know, I thank God for all the guidance that I have uh, from the spiritual people in my church, my pastor, Pastor Keaton, and other, uh, uh, my, my lady friend here, Anna. She always, you know, spiritual advisor, you know, so I have a lot of spiritual people around me that encourage me, so I pass my spiritual advisor on to others to keep, keep them uh, motivated and being interesting, to, you know, for them own self, you know. That's, yeah, that's great advice. Any last words, Barry? Uh, I just want to say my mom looks very pretty. Thank you. Yeah, shout <laughs> out to Mama shout Barry. Out to you. Thanks for coming Yeah, thank through. you for the shirt so much. We yeah, love it. Thanks for the shirt. Yeah, a little gift Live for you. Live at nine. Black nine. History Month. Every day. Every is day. Black History, right? Yes. Uh, special thanks to Mr. Bobby Hood for thank coming you, through. Yeah, thank you for inviting yeah. me. Yeah. It was thank a pleasure. Very, me. very interesting story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Be documented. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it yeah. does need to be. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. This here. Well, this Are you in that? You should be. Yeah. This was a story by the Watson... They, they lived in Michigan, uh -huh. and they left Michigan. They, they did like a road trip to, Bur to Birmingham, and they uh, was in Birmingham. They was at 16th Street Baptist Church. The children was there. At this, at this, this was true. The children was in the church when the church got bombed. Wow. This was their first trip to Birmingham from Michigan, and this was this was this was a story about the Watson coming to Birmingham. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Shout out to Will Harris. No, my boy. Movie. <laughs> and that's all the time we have tonight, folks. It's Live been a great show. Nine. You know the time. Live at nine. Peace out, y'all. BHM. Beautiful. That was fantastic. Oh.